Thank you very much. And um, thank you to everyone for tuning in and for rescheduling. If you um, just trying to hide this thing. Sorry, I'm hoping just the top part will go. Can you guys see the top bar? No. Okay. All right. I've got extra c controls. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for for reorganizing. I appreciate the extra time. I think um, if anything's taught me anything lately, anyone can attest to old injuries recurring at the worst possible time. Um, and uh, you know, self care has been really important through this pandemic. So um, I think I've 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 come to appreciate all that. And I'm very appreciative of the NAMPS team for for helping reorganize um, from two weeks ago. So I really do hope that this is a a sunny and happy, healthy gardening season for everyone. And that, um, you know, there's something in here for everybody um, from expert to uh, beginners. So we're going to punch through this and, and hopefully it'll it'll prompt lots of questions. I'm going to try to leave as much time as I can for FAQs. But um, one of the things that I would like to do is to, you guys have already been answering in the chat. I'd really like to do a few polls tonight. I think it would form some nice um, material for a Blazing Star article after this. So I just wanted to get Natasha to launch the first poll and just sort of resummarize where everyone's tuning in from if you didn't write in. Um, so we've got uh, sort of general areas. If you wanna, you don't have to answer, don't feel obliged, but it'd be nice to just get a, a picture and we'll leave it up for about 20 seconds. And uh, if you're, I'm, I'm, it's very interesting to see people from Chile um, writing into the chat from Western Canada. Um, I'm based right now in Fredericton. And um, yeah, it's really good. So I'll let Natasha sort of get a sense of as answers are rolling in and maybe in about 10 seconds, we'll close. And we'll show everyone what the diversity Diversity is. All right, five, four, three, two, one, <laughs> and close. Wow, okay. <laughs> that is, uh, that's a good mix. Um, excellent. Okay, all right. So, a good part of Central Canada. All right, so the second poll. So, even though this is a DIY seed series, um, I'm not not relegating it just to um, seeding, but uh, just in, in terms of your experience with propagating native plants yourself, um, sort of what your level of experience is, are you consider yourself a newbie, a beginner, intermediate? Um, I have some respect for a number of my colleagues I know that are professional growers, and I'm gonna call a few of them um, perhaps Jedi masters that they could grow anything. So how would you assess yourself on this spectrum? in about 10 seconds, if possible. <clears throat> All right. Looks good, Natasha. Five, four. Actually, I should answer. I'm going to answer one of them myself. Three, two, one. All right, a perfectly statistical normal curve. <laughs> oh, there's no more Jedi Masters in the crowd. I'm okay. All right. Well, that's okay. Um, this is good. Okay, so the third question, um, if you can think of between what you've bought or grown yourself, how many new native plant species have you added to your garden in the last five years? Uh, less than 10. Uh, 10 to 20 30 to 50. If you're in the 50 plus range that's been my target. Um, maybe you're still in transition mode or just getting going. So in about 10 seconds, might take some time to think of these. <clears throat> Five, four, three, two, one. Excellent. Also a good statistically normal curve. I like this. Well done. Okay. That is good. That will be good, good material. So my slides are taking a second to change. So in addition to Nance's um, acknowledgement, which is really nice, um, I just for my own personal sake, I want to say that I go back and forth now and I, I get to travel a lot with seeds. I've gotten to travel a lot of places in Canada and, and the US. Um, so I'm still on my learning journey in terms of 
you know, understanding truth and reconciliation and uh, which territories I'm crossing or I'm in and digging with, dealing with a lot of indigenous uh, groups that are really, you know, interested in seed conservation now. So I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, these people have been here for a long time before us. We have a lot to learn, a lot to make up for. And for me personally, native plant gardening really is about, you know, it's about a sense of place and it's about sort of healing the places that we're that we're at so i think that that's just a a really important thing and there's so many different books to read about this but i will state that um throughout this term or through this seminar um i do i because i was trained in latin and western botanical systems and because this audience is so diverse i do use latin because it is generally an unchangeable um uh, they don't change names as often as local languages, but I'd love to learn more of the indigenous languages. And I'm going to consider everything I talk about native plants here to mean something that lived in a local area prior to European colonization in the Americas. Um, and for those of you in Canada, but also the Nancy Turner's book here covers a, a range of U.S. Um, treaty rights and how it interacts with ethno botanical knowledge and, and, and land use. Um, it's a really fantastic book that just came out last year, and I've learned an awful lot about it in terms of um, indigenous uh, relationships to plants just beyond, you know, gardening. So definitely recommend that. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, Ali talked a lot about my background. It's very diverse. I'm very fortunate right now to be working. And I'm not sure if many people know that we have um, a national tree seed bank in Canada. It's one of the, it's one of our, our um, sort of agreements under the Canadian biodiversity strategy to maintain seed banks like this. Um, our seed bank is, is really, uh, interesting just because we have jars of seeds from, you know, their GPS, we know where they came from, we could go back and visit the same trees. And we've, we're still germinating seeds that are 50, 60 years old, and they're, they're coming up um, really well. So I'm really fortunate to have this. And it is really a backup plan to a lot of provincial and conservation projects. And I really got involved because of the ash tree and emerald ash borer issue um, when I was down in school and just did concentric circles of collecting seed. But we're fortunate now also to, to work with cryogenics. So we have the ability to store seeds that don't normally um, store for very long. And then we work with a number of different groups across Canada through Confergen to come up with plans that cross jurisdictional boundaries because species don't know boundaries. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start off with um, sort of these these myths and things that get perpetuated about seed. <laughs> and I think it's just, it's understanding the difference between wild seed and crop seed that, um, you know, wild seed is much more variable and that's what comes into play. And, you know, as I just said, we we're still germinating seed from the fifties and there's some assumption in, in sort of wild seed gene, uh, wild seed genetics that, that they don't last as long, but it's not necessarily true um, in terms of the standards that we use today. Um, and, you know, there's also the flip side of it where everyone thinks that every seed they buy should germinate and the bag of seed, you know, points out perfectly that that even in big bags of, of wild, you know, wild seed, you know, there is a fraction of it that can be not seed material, it could be weeds, it could be chaff, there's a fraction of those seeds that don't want to germinate and there's a, a section that is pure live seed, the PLS. Um, um, there's also things I see all the time that people are afraid to freeze seed, even though seed that can be dried and frozen is, is, a, is a very traditional or is a very conservative practice now. Um, local seed will always do better. Um, it is a good practice for sure, but there is also lots of science that says that, that some gene pools, you know, do perform better. There is variation in growth and genetics across the landscape, across a range. Um, I've seen this a lot and, you know, I know it might work for a few species, but putting damp seeds in the freezer is, is a, a surefire way to, to, you know, perhaps do some damage. You need to be very careful with this. Um, and collecting from the same plants every year should produce the same results. Wild seed doesn't behave that way. So we have to be just aware of the variation that exists. Um, and, you know, one thing I find that's really amazing and encouraging is just, I, I looked up Google Trends, what, how many people have been Googling seed saving and seed exchanges, um, and it's kind of transitioned from the high in 2004, 2005, and transitioned to these online groups. And I mean, I'm, I'm blown away by the number of groups and the membership expansion um, through COVID in particular, and even something as simple as, you know, Ontario pawpaws, one single species has almost a thousand people or almost 900 people talking about it. Um, but the flip side of this is that there's a lot of myths that get perpetuated, and there's also a lot of really great experienced people in these groups. And you can get seeds, 
you can trade seeds online now so much easier than you used to before. So I just want to encourage everyone to to keep this in mind as we go through the talk, talk that, you know, there's there's just so much out there now and it's hard sometimes to break through all the chatter. So um, what I do in terms of distilling, try to distill science um, and peer reviewed stuff down to practical advice. I mean, I began my journey just being a bookworm and and working at a nursery that, you know, needed to solve practical problems every day. And, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of reading and this book is a fantastic $215. I think I looked it up this week to spend on Amazon, um, you know, 13 co covers the globe, 13 1,600 species. And the amazing thing is, is it really just distills all seeds in the world down to five main categories. And they are also really well associated with ease of propagation. So if you do any amount of cut testing and you look at seeds, um, you know, fully developed embryos, how to recognize them, seeds that germinate within 30 days around the world are classified as non-dormant seeds. There's nothing keeping them asleep. They tend to be, it's 24% of the world's flora. They come from temperate areas. They tend to be our crop species like tomatoes and peppers and, and you know everything we eat generally is non-dormant seed or has been bred to be less dormant. And uh, those are from places where there isn't much of a season. So there's nothing detrimental to a seed waking up maybe other than it being a dry season rather than the wet season. Um, as we move into the temperate climates where you have winter and something you know below freezing and wet can die, easily um, we go, get into this class of, of you know more than 70 percent of the flora um, in our temperate zones and in Canada and in the northern U.S. have physiological dormancy so this is where the cold moist stratification tends to dominate how we treat these seeds um, we've got two other classes where the embryos are shed from the parent plants being underdeveloped so they need more time and they need to go through multiple cycles sometimes of seasons to break both the root dormancy and the shoot dormancy. So some of these can take, you know, two to three years. Some of them can be a season, but they need to have a very particular um, cycle. And then our physical dormancy seeds are basically just in a plastic bubble where the water can't get into the seed um, itself. So just nicking and scratching it, and they essentially then become non-dormant. So um, a lot of codes with, with germination treatments you might look up in New England Wildflower Society or Jolito's catalog or, you know, Prairie Moon has a really great filtering system. They tend to all associate with A, B, C, D, more complicated. And then there's ones that are um, combinational. But anyways, um, I'm just going to keep referring to these codes as we go through the presentation so you'll see um, some of them recurring. So one of the ones that I think is really fun in terms of a, a, a physical dormancy is, and I know it's a species at risk in Ontario, it should be protected where it is occurring, but it is really often planted in cities and a lot of the female trees set seed in most urban areas. Um, it is a huge embryo. It's nothing but a baby on the inside. And the it's neat when you look at them under a microscope because you can see their, their, little, their little leaves. And um, if you just put a nick in one side of it, soak them in water, you know, we soak, we nick these on a Friday, they were awake by Monday, and within three to five days, you can be transplanting them. Um, they're really fun things if you're in education to show kids if you can get your hands on a few of them in the city, and they almost always have a filled seed. But with other species, um, you know, there's a really great publication and it was amazing this guy thought of this in 1946 he went and just did these simple black and white diagrams to show people where embryos were in a ton of different wild seeds. Um, and I can give people the, the citation there you're, you can look it up. But anyways, anytime I go to work on a new species and I need to figure out where the baby should be sitting <laughs> and and how large it is or, or what the shape of it is, um, this is the kind of diagram that really helps us discern um, what kind of tissue we're looking at. And especially with with wild seed, a lot of them are empty. I mean, that green ash, I saw somebody collecting it on a project and I looked at it and said, yeah, it looked brown on the outside, looked ripe, but we cut it open and there's no babies inside. Um, and just for Valentine's Day, I put a hickory hickory nut in there. So a lot of this, a lot of the embryos in this publication um, that are extremely tiny are also the ones that have the more complicated dormancy stratification um, requirements. So any time you have really small rudimentary embryos, you know that you're going to have to spend a bit more time. So I'll just um, go through this quickly. I know Paul will probably cover a lot of this in the next um, chat. I mean. 
depending on where you are in your in your propagation journey, the difficulty about seed propagation always sort of comes down to this. It's a, you know, how big is the seed collection window? Um, what is the dormancy class that it's in in terms of how you need to think about the treatment from the beginning? Um, can you dry the seed or is it very sensitive to desiccation? Um, if, if anyone knows recalcitrants versus orthodox, um, you know, orthodox species are ones that can take a little bit more of our human behavior in terms of ignoring things. And then of course, we're talking now about number of plants that you want to grow. So again, going back to that dormancy classification, you know, non-dormant or very lightly phys physiological dormancy and uh, the physical dormancies where you just nick and scratch. You know, most of these species here produce ample amounts of seed. You can forget about them on, on a dresser for a day or two and it, and it doesn't matter. Um, as you get down that list, you know, um, Acer saccharinum, which is silver maple, it is a recalcitrant species. You have to be careful with it, but it's fun to play with because they tend to be, you know, they fruit regularly. They grow in most cities. They set ample amounts of seed that people just sweep up and discard. So they're, they're really fun. You just keep them moist and sow them quickly. Um, as you get into expanding your plant palette and your, your willingness to sort of do a little bit more and, and follow more complicated things, I mean, most herbaceous perennials that set seed in the late summer and fall are not going to have seed that germinates, um, you know, at the end of October, early November in our climate. So they are ones that are going to need to follow the season and be cold moist stratified. Um, same with most native grasses, carex, juncus, and then you'll get down into things like conifers and some more trees that have rodent problems, and that's more of a challenge than anything. But also in there is your fleshy fruits, so anything you got to clean off that has chemical inhibitors. Um, the fleshy fruits have a, a big diversity of, of dormancy classes, so they tend to start being ones that take two to three years to wake up. And then if you answered the Jedi Master question, um, this is where you're dealing with, you know, likely a lot of math in terms of seed. Um, if you're doing direct seeding projects, you know, prairie establishment is a complicated thing. Um, if you're in the species at risk recovery, S1, S2 rank species, um, woodland ephemerals are extremely complicated. If, and if anyone can crack the Tilia Americana code, I'm sure some people would love you. Um, clonal shrubs, I mean, there's just a lot of other species like uh, Comptonia peregrina has a lot of seed limitations. And then um, I've got some experience growing ferns from spore or at least collecting spore for propagation, a little bit of terrestrial orchids. And uh, I'm not that familiar with a lot of aquatic plants, but they're just also challenging to collect. So that would sort of span the gamut, I think, in terms of how complex it can be. And uh, hopefully, you know, you, you, you kind of know where you sit now. <laughs> um, okay, so next set of polls. We're doing good on time here. So if Natasha wants to launch, I'm really curious the way that we phrase this is sort of what is more important to you um, at the stage that you're at now and in the next couple of years, you know, or do you want to save more money? Do you want to save more time and just enjoy the garden um, for what it is? Do you just like experimenting? Um, sharing your successes with others. If, if I missed something here, you can always write it in the chat. And I'm going to answer myself here. So maybe in five, four, three, two, one. They're still rolling in, Natasha. Excellent. <laughs> Regardless of time or money. Okay. <laughs> um, that's, that's good. That is a good, good thing. Excellent. I like people with no bounds. Um, okay. So think about what native propagation methods have worked best for you. Um, choose, choose your top three or even your top one, but top three would be sort of a balance. I'd really love to see some folks here that have maybe done some grafting and, you know, if you can't if you can't accomplish seed root and cuttings is totally acceptable um i'm going to include plant rescue because that one is important okay maybe i'll give you guys f 10 more seconds to think about this one if it's taking a bit of time i'm just going to check the chat really quickly Okay, three, two, one. Uh, 
That is a very, that's a good balance. I like this. All right. Excellent. So, I mean, that, that kind of, that kind of set of answers tells me that, you know, seed, I'm so glad there's an interest in seed, but I mean, it is, it is not the only, the only thing that exists for certain plants. And if you're doing your research, there's some really great books that sort of balance out, you know, the sort of time versus efficiency thing. Um, so I'll keep going here. Okay. Um, so I didn't want to steal Paul Thunder too much on this, but you know, I think for people at the beginning um, part of it, if you haven't been into propagating or collecting anything yet, I think that it, um, you know, you can get away with quite a minimal amount of equipment, but it does help to buy certain things. Um, you know, those little cutting blades, I find in very helpful for very tiny seeds just to keep, you know, crushing and they're very sharp. Um, you know, I have a grow stand behind me because I can't live without propagating something in the wintertime and in the fall it becomes my drying rack in the spring it's the you know the growing rack um you know I've got gotten to the point where my mom hates me taking over the kitchen so I've got my own blender now and and you know I bought a really nice set of sieves from uh this strictly medicinal seeds place is pretty good for for starting sieves and I've made it pretty well with that um so yeah I mean for less than a thousand dollars you can get away with with being well set up for a, a pretty big diversity of species. And most of the time it's just fighting for fridge space, maybe with your kids' lunches. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're only needing 10 to 100 plants from that easy to grow list, the, the non-dormant, the lightly dormant, um, you know, the ones where you just nick and scarify and soak them, you know, a grow stand's a great, a great place to do it. I really, you know, like, I, I like how the baggy method has become, you know, so, so well um, documented online, especially there's so many Google or YouTube videos now about it. I mean, personally, I prefer to sow seeds that have been soaked and are ready to set a root out right into soil only because I, I think that it's, you know, sometimes wild seeds are such a hard won commodity these days that the, the baggy method, you know, you, you always run the risk of damaging um, very delicate roots. And I find it hard to transplant off paper. We do germination testing at our seed center and it is, it's difficult sometimes to get, you know, transplantable seedlings from there. Um, and the one thing I wanted to point out was just, you know, if, if you're starting off and you haven't thought too much about the garden space yet, is that growing, planning your vegetable garden and planning your, your indoor sowing at the same time um, with some of your, your, your easy to grow, your easy to grow species is just, it's, it makes sense to put them all on the same list, have your schedule that way. Um, and, and a warming mat is really good for, for a lot of the native plant species as well. You get really rapid germination just as much as vegetables. And it's kind of crazy how much you can fit into a couple of salad containers. Um, and one of the things that I found really successful is, you know, integrating some of, especially the full sun plants, um, is integrating them as with your starting nursery, with your vegetable garden. This is my brother's garden last year, um, that I grew for him mostly in Fredericton and then drove it home to Bethany, which sounds crazy, but, um, you know, your vegetable garden tends to be, you know, frequently watered. You're protecting it for, you know, you're weeding it. You've got lots of protection from, uh, from animals or the dogs or whatever. And the garden maintenance cycle tends to line up well with transplanting, um, you know, most, most of the fast growing non-dormant and PD and PY species, they'll be big enough by the fall, or even if you hedge, uh, tuck them in for the winter, you can move them easily the next spring. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out was, you know, in, in, in contribution to NAMPS is wonderful and long running programs is that, you know, if Janice Keel's listening, um, she might remember in 2018, I volunteered at the Peterborough Garden Show at the booth just to help answer questions. Lots of great questions about why we didn't have, you know, blood root available in paper packets and, and all of these species that are complex dormancy. Um, but, you know, at the end of the show, there wasn't a huge variety of things left, but I, I still, you know, for $48 to get this many seed packets and this much diversity of things I'd never grown before, I made a plan to grow 100 species that year that were new. Um, so I made my list. I looked up all of the, the dormancy classifications. I kept them dry in a, in a sealed bucket. I'll show you towards the end of the presentation. Um, I looked up what was locally native to my area. So what I was adding diversity to native populations, I could, you know, supplement myself. A huge number of the ones there that are just in black were they're native to Ontario, but not to my local area in Peterborough. Um, there was two species that are that were non sort of native to my area, but 
you know, being moved around and obviously gardeners were wanting to share them. Um, so it was, you know, really great to have this big package and I decided to sow them November 4th and I checked out all the seeds. I have a book at home where I wrote down how many seeds were in each packet and um, made this little garden area. And then um, it was it was a really sort of just fun thing to tuck in. This was a side project and, you know, I did little, sowed them like lettuce seed, vegetable rows about 12 inches apart. Um, I would cover them with a little bit of sawdust. I tucked in a few bulb crates there, but most of those got destroyed by mice and rodents, despite metal, heavy metal on top of them. And then um, in the springtime, I, I sort of went back and did a little Sunday afternoon um, with a tea and, and sort of marked off what I got to germinate. And, you know, for, for those little packets, for the, the time and expense and the way that I did it, for them to just be cold, moist, stratified all at the same time, um, you know, everything came up pretty much gangbusters, but there was a few things that I, I, I thought backwards thinking I should have done some cut testing, um, you know, and I wasn't sure if seeds were dead or empty, but you know, I, I didn't really get any Coreopsis. There was no Verona castrum, no Desmodium, which should be a really easy one. The bladder nut possibly got eaten by mice because it's probably the tastiest and largest seed. And I know that there's um, seed and pollination limitations with big leaf aster. And then the other ones, you know, there was just not that much germination. It was variable. Maybe it was because of the dormancy, but I got maybe one each of the iris, the wild yam, the sylphium. Um, I got one rudbeckia and uh, maybe four or five penstemon out of, you know, probably 50 or 60 seeds that were in the packages. So it's a big amount of diversity and the species that were prolific were prolific, but I'll say that the, um, you know, it was an absolute joy to just have this many plants come out of those little packages. And I'm very aware now of um, how quick a turnaround most of those species are and why they're so frequently traded at seed exchanges. However, I will say too, is that, you know, the ones that I, I would only recollect and reshare some of these seeds where there was enough, um, you know, where there was 20, 25 or more plants that came out of those packages. Um, oh, my bumblebee keeps going, but, but anyways, I mean, something as amazing as, you know, the white wood aster was just a pillow of clouds two years later. I did get one or two pawpaws that evaded the, uh, the mice. And, um, you know, this bed, I know, it, I know this is probably a luxury to most people, but having a nursery bed like this that was protected from my dogs and my mom's chickens, um, and I could just sort of observe and watch and put as much material in here as I could, um, it really is nice to have a place that is just a dedicated sort of, you know, bulk up area. And I, I keep intending and keep trying to add um, unrelated sources so that I can improve the cross pollination. Because that is what I was meaning is that, you know, with with garden trading seed and with people building up, um, you know, seed supply, either at a commercial level or or for restoration. I mean, I think it always comes back to like asking questions about um, it's one of the things that's very rarely labeled on seeds is how many parent plants went into the package. I wouldn't, you know, the sylphium plant did try to set seeds, probably because it was being pollinated with a bunch of other unrelated um, asters in that same bed. But, you know, the seeds are all empty. So if I repackaged that and gave that to someone, I'd feel pretty bad <laughs> knowing what I know. And, um, you know, I just hope everyone, when you think of your gardens, you, you think about the diversity and number of, you know, parents and grandparents in there and what is being contributed by sharing. <sighs> okay, so if you're at the point now where you've got a bigger piece of property or you're doing a community project, um, if you're starting to think about growing a hundred or a thousand of something and it's in the more, you know, the sort of middle complexity um, uh, level of dormancy and also, you know, collection challenges or bigger, you know, trees and shrubs, especially, they just start to take up a lot more space. Um, I don't have a ton of experience personally with doing the winter sowing and the jug. No, no, no. Oh, is someone mute? Thanks, Cassie. Um, yeah, so I don't have a ton of experience with the winter jug sewing method, but I've seen some pretty amazing photos on the Facebook group, you know, when people have good success with that and it's, and it's been a well-protected area and they've sown a lot of different seeds. I mean, I think people's biggest reaction most of the time is I didn't think it would start to take up this much space. 
Um, and I think that is, you know, I really love the native plants journal propagation database because it really start it lays out not just the seed germination parts of, of, of so many different native plants and people's experience, but it really lays out what you have to think about for the following steps. Um, and, you know, what kind of soil and what kind of, you know, potting system will make sure that what you germinate turns into good, healthy, viable root systems. And, you know, you have enough, you have enough, uh, you know, um, you've got enough to keep you going through a season, especially if it's going to be hot and dry and, uh, you know, you got to think about watering. So, you know, um, these little, my, one of my dad's employees came up with these things we jokingly called the trip box. So we would artificially stratify our oaks in the fridge to keep them from being eaten by mice um, and then late March we would put them in these these really they're really shallow it's only like an inch um, deep of, of peat moist peat put the plastic over top of it put a sort of lid on it and just lean it up against a heater and you know we could sort of pluck out every few days and just transplant the seeds that germinated um, and it's really fun just to watch them that way so you know 1200 oak trees starts to take up a lot of space and my my brother um, and my dad have been growing a lot more. Um, we're trying to grow more oaks, oaks and hickories to put them back on the farms um, around us. Um, okay, so getting into more complicatedness now is the woodland ephemeral game. And I know everyone loves to see these at plant sales in bloom, in their glory, the way they should look. Um, but when I started uh, researching how to produce more of these sustainably and, you know, not digging up plants out of the wild, trying to establish some, some seed beds is a very slow process. I mean, growing some trilliums took me a couple years of killing seed and then, you know, getting stuff from seed to flower takes five years at the absolute fastest you can push it. Um, but this, this paper in 20, 2008 that I found from, from actually Quebec was a really great study in terms of just the underground phenology of, of most woodland ephemeral plants. And I mean, we're talking about seed, but with these plants, you really have to consider everything about them. The media, the best time to move them tends to be in the summer and autumn when they're putting more energy into the root system than into the top. The worst time to move these plants is when they're in flower because they're putting so much effort into you know, that short season that they have before the trees flush out. Um, so, you know, when you're working with more complicated plants, I keep a very good photo journal of these things in terms of, of you know, the stages that I see them go through and when I've had, you know, when I failed <laughs> at things and when I've had good successes. Um, so if you get into the more complicated things, this is just, I mean, this is probably insider information perhaps, but you know, a lot of these species and this, this is also would work well too for most of the, um, the less complicated ones, but species that need shade, species that are woodland um, obligates, you know, they need um, a long time. So you want to tag them. I find pencils and pencil tags are much better than, than marker. Um, but you need a really good water holding, high moisture retention mix. You would want to have a more sort of permanent shade area for them. Um, sowing depth is really interesting with a lot of these species because they're used to being, you know, anything with an eliasome is used to being buried by ants. And it can actually tolerate, I've, I've learned my lesson a lot of times about they can go deeper than you think just because um, if they're on the surface, they frost heave and they tend to get more damaged by, by freeze thaw through the winter. Um, so yeah, we, you know, I've used hydrogen peroxide as one of my other tricks. A lot of the species that want to go moldy, um, you know, a 3% hydrogen peroxide soak for 10 to 20 minutes really gets rid of a lot of fungal issues. Um, sowing them within 10 days, making sure that you keep them cool and moist, weed free should also be in there, um, minimizing disturbance and then, you know, transplanting in that dormant period in, in late summer. But even just, I mean, again, the genetic variation that comes up, I, I collected sanguinary in two places, I think in 2017, and these, you know, these areas show the seedling density, the Niagara stuff germinated like crazy the first year and the second year, you know, don't throw your flats out right away because they might still just be asleep. The Niagara stuff germinated um, really well the following year. Okay, we are at time for me to take another water break. And so another poll is we're going to talk about seed storage now. Um, so we're going to be getting away from from talking about seeds that have to stay damp. And this is about dry seeds. So you can count your vegetables too, but I'm just curious if you know how old the oldest seed is that you've grown into a happy plant. <laughs> I'm going to answer myself.
<clears throat> All right, maybe. <clears throat> I have four, three, two, one. Just keeping you guys all awake. Less than five years. Oh, excellent. Okay, so there's a few. Good. I'd be very interested to know whoever's in the 10 to 30 and 30 plus range to write in which species it was in the chat. Um, okay, and then uh, poll seven. So at home, if you have dry seeds, and if you know the term orthodox, I mean, seeds that tend to come in paper packages um, or are generally sold through the mail that are not packed in moist peat, how do you store your dry seeds at home until you're ready to sow them? So you can choose any sort of combination of things that you do. I'm gonna pick mine. Mm. <clears throat> okay, maybe 10 seconds to think. <clears throat> Five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna check the chat really quick. Still coming in there. Excellent. Okay. Wooden and cardboard boxes. Excellent. In the fridge and Ziploc bags or plastic containers. Okay. All right. So this is a this is an exciting part for me because I, I don't want to I don't want to burst too many bubbles, but um, the fridge is a very damp place. <laughs> okay. My my slide's not changing. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> um. So there is. Um, a lot of rules. I'm sure people have heard these, um, you know, in terms of there's one rule I see, I, I know on vegetable seed saving, you know, the combination of, of degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity should be um, less than 100. And that's good. Um, I think one of the things that is often with wild seeds is one of the biggest killers, because within the first 10 days, you can do a lot of damage um, by leaving things in cars. And or you know leaving thing putting things too cold too soon um a lot of a lot of the issues that can start right from the very beginning with with the myths about wild seed or the fact that that handling it is really difficult especially when there's so much diversity but in general you know if you the q seed information database um is one of the the best resources i know of it's unfortunate they're going to take it down soon so i will share that link in the chat that you know if you want to go research a few seeds um about how to store them. Um, that database is fantastic. And when I went to the Millennium Seed Bank, I mean, they've really made a lot of things clear. And this graph really shows that, you know, it's it's good for seeds to stay continually stratifying if you're intending to sow them right away. So, you know, relative humidity um, in your fridge is often between 85 to 100. Um, if you put paper in the fridge, it will absorb water and seeds will get close to, but not they're not wet enough to to be um, stratifying properly, but they're also in the bad or the okay range where they're probably getting, um, you know, cellular damage, but they can't repair it. Um, and for, you know, the next slide, I'll show you a bit, but, you know, it's really, it's really good to be aware of moisture. Your fingers are also not capable of measuring anything below 90%. And some of these little tools that people have, I mean, that sugar maple seed that we put in this little jar, you know, it's, that, that seed is, is cooking. <laughs> it is hot and it is humid and it is not going to last very long or grow very good seeds. So it's always good when people say keep things cool and moist or cool and dry. Um, there, it should be somewhere in the you know forty percent range or lower if you can get to that. And that doesn't you know you have to be conscious before you seal things up in a jar um, about that humidity. So you know. I will say for the people that are tuning in from maybe Arizona or from Western Canada, you have a really big benefit of having good weather most of the time for seed drying. Um, Toronto and area folks and Eastern Canada, we live in a very humid climate most of the time. 
Um, the best time to be conditioning your seeds, I mean, you need to get them dry after harvest within 10 days. But if you want to like store some things for a bit longer term, the best time to take them out and recondition them is when you have dry skin. And that is kind of now, anytime the temperature is below minus 10. Um, and yeah, like I said, uh, the only risk in the prairies in Alberta sometimes is your humidity is so low that you can actually take things um, too far dry and then they suffer um, damage by having all of the water sucked out of them. Um, so it's just kind of a general rule. If there's dew outside on the grass in the morning, you're going to need fans or, you know, a dehumidified room to dry your seeds or repackage them up at night. And I used to do this for cleaning garlic as well. The best time to clean garlic is between 2 and 6 p.m. Because that is when the air is dry and you can get the skins off. So if you do anything with onions or garlic, that also is kind of a, a good rule. Um, so there's all these cool little tools now that exist and most of them are pretty cheap. A lot of them work, they, they data log and they can sync to your phone. Um, this little X-Tech one that I first bought it, I, I changed it with a, with a, a lid from you know Michael's and I put a car gasket from Canadian Tire and the little probe on the end means I can fit that seed in and tell, the, tell me now that that sugar maple seed is safe to put in a jar and put it in a freezer. I can, I can say that safely now because I have a number to make a decision on. And the graph here just shows that, you know, for, for orthodox seeds, the other benefit of getting seeds dry is that you're reducing, you know, that those graphs go down, like bacteria can grow up to, to about, um, you know, it, the equivalent there of the water activity is 80% relative humidity. Yeast still grows at 70, you know, 70%. Mold will still grow, a lot of xeric molds can still grow um, above 60% relative humidity. You might not be able to tell that. Um, and the other thing too is the star there, that dip in lipid oxidization, seeds will, seeds that are very oily, um, if you can get them down to that level, that is the least reactive and, and damaging aging process um, part of it. So that's why when we talk about seed saving, you know, it, it, there's, there's higher levels for international seed banks. Like you'll see seed banks that say we get things down to 15% relative humidity. Um, but for Canada and for, for you guys, you know, for wild seed, if you can keep it below 40% um, and it be sealed in a jar and stable, um, you're doing really, really well. And you will get double or triple the lifespan out of seeds that you buy. Um, so yeah, this is this is my process most years um, for for anything that I do, either professionally or just for fun. You know, uh, even if I'm doing shrub species, so this is a purple flying raspberry. Put it in the blender, float off all the floaters. You know, put it out in some newspaper to dry for a couple of days. Put a fan on it. Um, I will sort of. I have a different bucket I'm going to show you guys, but you know, in the winter time, if we need to dry things down further, this is at our seed bank um, out here, you know, some seeds tend to start absorbing water if the lid um, broke. So we will check them every year with our little water hygrometers and redry them. So we just let the natural air in the seed center suck it out. And then we seal them back up and put these little desiccation things in them. That's my home jar for a bunch of the seeds I had from NAMPS and some vegetable garden seed. Um, so those little humidity indicators are cheap and you know that tells me I need to take that jar open um, in the winter time and, and redry it. So they can stay stable for, for quite a long time. And definitely make sure you document things. Keep a, keep a master register. Um, so yeah, this is my little mini seed vault. Um, I, if, if my house was ever on fire, I tell my mom, this is the first thing she needs to grab. Um, because it has, you know, we probably have 30 or 40 years worth of vegetable seed in here. And I also have most of my, my sort of high one, um, waiting for a garden space to grow orthodox species. So yeah, it's a five gallon pail. Um, there's these gamma seal lids. So that red ring there um, has a has an airtight seal in it. And the, the you, you put the red ring on top of the pail, pound it on with a hammer, and then it screw tops tight. Um, so it makes that basically like an airtight um, room. And then I use silica gel that you can buy from silicagelpackets.ca, not that expensive. And I have the, the little uh, digital hygrometer. Um, I like the Kestrel ones just because you can Bluetooth it through the bucket, so you don't even have to open the bucket. And then I set my phone between 20 to 40 percent humidity, and and you add or subtract uh, silica gel as needed. And it's kind of like a one to one ratio. If you put sort of semi damp seeds in there, um, the weight of all your seed packages, you just add the same amount of silica gel. Um, yeah, so you wouldn't use plastic bags at all in this sense. 
And, um, you know, you can also then once everything's tight in there and everything is stabilized to around 30% humidity, you can move the pail to a closet, a basement, you can maybe fit it in your, your home freezer. Um, the, the important part here again is that seeds are the dry first. It is, you'll get more life out of them being dry first than cold. And uh, yeah, the silica gel, I really like this stuff. It's a lot safer than older ones that um, were a little bit more carcinogenic, but um, silica gel starts to turn um, green around 25% humidity. It'll be really dark green by 40%. So you can just recharge it in your home oven and reuse it almost ad infinity. Um, yeah, so we're getting towards the end now. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, if, if you're in, if you're in, the business of growing a lot of plants or you have a really big project to work on there's a lot of math involved this is when i would be consulting nurseries um you know this is just one excerpt from from uh, the new usda hardwood bare root production manual and i know you know a number of the growers that are probably listening on this this is your your daily life is trying to worry about hitting these numbers um and you know when it comes to these these species where you need a lot of space a lot of equipment um, a lot of hands on deck and a lot of attention to detail, like with fern growing um, at my parents' nursery. You know, this is this is fern spore that I collected from my brother's woods. So this is Christmas fern that's local, um, sent away for propagation and then brought back and, and potted up. So you know, ten thousand ferns at a time produced from local spore is is no small feat. Um, so a lot of these things, I think, if you're going to get into this level of detail, I mean, there are professionals out there that uh, that are really worth talking to and um, finding out um, what sort of you know resources they started with or or what you know exists um, in the commercial sector. Um, so I just kind of want to end towards this part, which is you know, there's a very big awareness I think these days of 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 how much um, seed we need, like globally. Um, I know there's big assessments going on in the US. There's a huge movement in the States with, um, you know, their native seeds sector strategy. And, you know, I think Canada does benefit a lot from surplus in the US, especially along, you know, the, the settled landscape borders. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of good growers in Canada. Um, and as much as some people might sometimes think there's a lot of gaps, um, I would tend to think that, you know, having 270 commercial entities or so that, that sort of are open and available to uh, uh, to publics and professional restoration people, um, you know, it would be really interesting to do a similar study or we're trying to work on a similar study with my work to figure out if we have, you know, similar representation of, of, of species in production. You know, in 2018, um, uh, a group from university or the botanical garden in Chicago sort of found 841 vendors in the States and out of all of the US taxa, which is over 25,000 species that are native to the US, you know, 26% were available. And then in certain regions that have had a lot of support like the Midwest with all the prairie, um, tall grass prairie restoration, you know, 74% of the species were available. It, there's still some room to go there, but if we extrapolated that to Canada, you know, we have around 5,924 15, uh, vascular plant species, and um, I would be interested to know if we've got 1,500 available on the market. And, you know, if you add it in, if you go back to the, the, the sort of Facebook thing, I think that there's a good chance that, you know, when I see people put their wish lists up and get some of them answered, there's a lot of people trading small amounts of the really difficult things. So I think there's there's more available than than people um, assumed. And I, it's just really encouraging to see so much so much interest in it. So um, so I'm going to leave that there. I do have a couple other slides in reserve, but I did want to get to some questions if there is some. And uh, I think we'll have a good good chance to chat and anyone can find me on uh, Instagram or Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't post there often. And um, yeah, I know that was a whirlwind, but uh, hopefully, hopefully you've, you've gotten some, some uh, sense of sense of the amount of places you could start. Um, okay. Okay, so we have been getting some questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Melissa, for all of that. Um, and I will start with the first question, which is from Natasha from NAMPS. Uh, <laughs> is there a native grass to replace a large lawn for the Toronto area? What about the eco grass mixture? Are they native and do you recommend them? Oh, 
So I had slides that I, I, I the NAMS teams know that I carved out a lot of slides. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things that I think that I wanted to, to start with, but I, I kind of think that most people, or perhaps I assumed, um, you know, knowing what is native to your area is a really important starting point. Um, I would definitely recommend talking to the local conservation groups and, you know, like when I did that plant list of the seed packets that I just picked up for, for fun, um, you know, I hadn't checked them prior. And I looked up the, uh, in Ontario, we have the natural heritage information system in most states and, and, and provinces you have conservation data centers, you know, they can really tell you and should be able to narrow it down what is eco regionally appropriate. Um, I know that on, I mean, I'm not a native grass expert per se, but I know that, you know, some of the eco lawn mixtures, they're a blend and they're a blend because of traits that are uh, you know appropriate and needed for for achieving what people want to achieve with them native plants get that reputation all the time of not being as robust as as non-natives and you know i think i think native plant growers do their best to you know to fill that void but inevitably with some of those really hard trafficked areas you're going to wind up with um non-native fescues and and another species being put in there. So I think if you're really truly going after 100% native, um, you need to check with a, a plant list that is ecologically or, or you know, botanically based from, from surveys and from reference ecosystems. Another one. Um, so we had a few questions oh, many. from people who um, were asking why their seeds get moldy when they try to stratify them in the fridge with the paper towel and the bag. Yes. Okay. And I've had this experience many times trying to do that. A um, couple of things is, you know, this is why I started doing hydrogen peroxide as a standard treatment for a lot of my seeds before I did that, because, um, you know, seeds come with a lot of natural pathogens on them. And there's a couple of things that cause mold. One, it's either that there was already stuff on the paper towel and it came out of your kitchen from being near fruits and vegetables sometimes. Two, it's because the seeds that did go moldy died legitimately or were dead to begin with or they were empty because empty seeds are just a harbor for bacteria and then three it's that perhaps the um you know again it's why i like sowing in real soil because real soil tends to have um you know you tend to wind up with some protective benefits of of microbiota that counteract some of the fungi and if you sow in peat um Peat is naturally antimicrobial to, to an extent and putting anything in solid matrix media um, can be quite helpful. And that's, again, I, I'm not a massive fan of the paper bagging method, except for things that, uh, you know, you're just, you're germination testing a sample of the real, the full lot. So, um, yeah, but any, uh, look up uh, Norman Dino and a number of, um, some of the, some of the good, some of the good, uh, like the BC seed handling guide, even though it's very much about conifers, it's free, but they've got some really great information about seed sanitation if you're going to do big amounts of stuff. And it works for most species. But hydrogen peroxide, you can get them at Shopper's Drug Mart. 3% is all you need. Um, it doesn't harm, it actually enhances a lot of germination because it helps uh, oxygen get into the, the seed coats more thoroughly. So many questions. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, so we had a few questions about your starting media generally, and then one um, that was a bit more specific that says sometimes when I collect seed, especially of woodland plants, I collect some of the soil where the parent plants are growing and then sow that seed and growing medium with a lot of the native soil mixed in. What do you think of this idea? Um, I, there's, uh, there's, there's a, there's definitely a benefit to doing that. I've done that myself sometimes um, to get some sort of reference for, for, I mean, often when I've done certain things, if it's a really challenging species, we've been sending, you know, I'll send a native soil sample away to get analyzed to just see what is sort of chemically in there. Um, you know, I do know that there's a lot of restoration techniques that move um, pieces of sod and, you know, chunks of soil around because it helps inoculate, you know, an, an area that would be otherwise without them. Um, I'm trying to go back to my slide one second where I, I get back, I get out of my, hold on one second. I just want to go back to the slide where I had the, um, uh, 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 escape. 
where I showed the here. Actually, I'll show, I'll show the Trillium one because I didn't get to show that one. I'll just go through this. Yeah, this was this was one I didn't get a chance to show, but um, this, so the media that we use for a lot of our woodland plants, um, the interesting thing about my parents' nursery is that, you know, my dad hasn't gone back to, he had, we don't grow on, um, we don't grow on, on sort of hard surfaces per se. We do have a greenhouse that has a sand base um, that's kept relatively weed free. But most of our most of the propagation beds um, are on rotten sawdust, and it's it's both to help with managing water um, because we let things. It's like you know the New England Wildflower Society. When I see their propagation areas, you know they are in trays. But if you have an open, if you have an ability for plants that need a lot of water to root down into a media below you, you buy yourself a time on the weekends or on you know vacation. But b you also wind up getting inoculum from the ground, and um, the rotten sawdust. Uh, compost mixtures that we use, you know, they're very rich. They're, they're, they're basically half humus um, and they have a lot of mu natural mushrooms in them. I mean, we get oodles of mushrooms that come up with our plants. And I think that's, I've always thought that that's really good for them. I, the slow nutrient cycling um, and decomposition that happens in, in, in a woodland environment, you need to sort of emulate. And some people sort of do this with Hugo culture, if you're doing shrubs or something in, in a garden bed, but in a propagation bed, um, having a really, really, you know, loose, friable, but, but rich uh, media. And in central Ontario, I mean, if you've got anywhere where you can go to, um, not necessarily municipal compost, but if you can go find a, a, a sawmill that does mixed wood cutting and get sawdust that is a, both a mix of hardwoods and conifers, it's, it's a really great starting media um, for, for a lot of these plants, especially if they need to sit for four or five years. And I'm just going to point out that picture there, but the, the, that's, that's Canadian ginger in, in peroxide, but anything with an eliasome again, those eliasomes and the, the trillium picture at the top. I don't know if anyone else has ever licked a trillium, but it's a sugar packet. It, it attracts ants because it's sugar. And so sugar grows mold. So if you put anything with a eliasome, especially in paper baggy methods, that's what I did the first year in 2015. I killed them all because I'd miss, I misunderstood how much mold would grow, how quickly, um, on that. So hydrogen peroxide is just, it's a great all around use. And if you can find a really nice media with extra uh, nutrients in it, even if it's a bit of the, the inoculum from the wild woodland area, I think, I think that's a good thing to do. The only thing you run the risk of is bringing in, you know, especially if you're in an area with lots of garlic mustard, you just don't want extra weeds. <laughs> so. Ready for the next? <laughs> Next question. Uh, we had a few and Donna and I were wondering about this as well. What was the blender for on your equipment slide? <laughs> oh, the blenders for, oh, I mean, um, oh, this one's a picture. I mean, the blender, like having a dedicated blender, especially with plastic blades that won't cut seeds for fleshy fruits. Like, you know, if you're going to grow, if you're going to grow anything, um, viburnum family, uh, blueberries, raspberries, uh, cherries, anything with a fleshy fruit, service berries, um, having a, a blender that's dedicated to wild seed, just because I don't like to mix my, f some of the things are edible, of course, but there's certain things in fruit, especially if it's fermented, I wouldn't want to, I have a dedicated uh, blender for, for processing wild, wild seeds and fruits just to you know, this one is, this one's at our, our, uh, our, at our seed center. We've gotten some really good high powered ones, um, just for processing dogwoods and, and different things. So yeah, it's meant, it's meant to macerate the fruit off. It simulates, a, a, it's a bird eating it or, or it going through an animal's tract. Um, okay. Next one. I'm trying to put emphasis on ensuring seeds slash seedlings I plant are from a local seed zone to maintain genetic diversity. How mm -hmm. important is this effort? I.e. if planting wild columbine from London area in Muskoka, how much of an issue might it be in the long run? Oh, jumpins. Um, so <laughs> we get asked this all the time with work. So <clears throat> um, the, 
The biggest and broadest answer I can tell everyone on the call from everywhere you are is that, you know, the biggest emphasis on studying native plant diversity has truly and honestly been put into commercial timber species and timber wood supply because we need that for growing homes and <clears throat> and forest industry. The lessons learned through that, if you know what a common garden study is, where people go and sample a whole range wide of, of different seeds, and this is what our seed bank does. I mean, we we helped fuel, you know, if, if white spruce grows coast to coast, a lot of these jars of seeds and it's probably that's probably actually the the pink ones. Um, you know, these represented what we would start off with as a common garden. So we'd get 200 seed sources from 200 different white spruce stands, plant them in 10 different areas, and then go back and measure them and see how each of those species reacted to being moved around to the same place. And when you bring a whole bunch of different seed sources into one area um, that are vastly different, you know, if there is a lot of genetic variation in a species, you will see it expressed in a common garden. Um, moving seed from, say, Niagara to, to uh, you know, up to Muskoka's, um, I just tell everyone when you're experimenting with that stuff, just keep notes. And if something is thriving, um, it's hard to discern sometimes why, unless you, you have some comparison moving one thing one place um, without a control or without um, you know enough enough different populations i don't think that you you can you can always you can't discern necessarily scientifically what the perfect thing to do is and that's why those that's it's why the programs in the us are so strong because they're they're doing more of the template that forestry figured out with um you know lesser species and when it comes to species conservation, I will say one other thing about that answer is that if the species at risk, that is even more imperative that you understand the, the repercussions of moving it, or if it's a really rare species. Um, I think a lot of people get the, the misinterpretation that moving, you know, moving and migrating species at risk around, and I know Kentucky coffee tree was an example, but, um, you know, moving them around should benefit them, but sometimes you know, keeping them local is the best thing for them. And that's where it just, it takes, it takes some research and figuring out, you know, if it's a really common species, moving it up to a garden and just enjoying it, if it thrives, great. If it doesn't survive, you know that that's not a good thing to do. Um, I think it not surviving at all is, is your biggest answer. Um, so I know that that's a bit vague, but it, there's a lot of research to be done in this. And it's why I think, you know, we need public support for these kinds of programs to, to, to look at and encourage even just you know, universities and, and different researchers to stay interested in this stuff and find funding to answer these questions. And actually, I'll bring up one point is that I do know a researcher in Quebec that was studying blueberry um, plants for an indigenous group, I think, for a restoration project. And they figured out the, that some of the local blueberry plants don't like to be moved more than five kilometers in Quebec. So sometimes they can be that hyper local, but it, it's going to be it's going to be, it depends all on observation. You got to make, you got to make notes. You got to make observations. <clears throat> okay. A couple of follow-ups to the peroxide question. Um, how do you apply the hydrogen peroxide to seeds in paper towel? And can I apply peroxide to seeds that are already in the fridge? Yes. And yes. Um, so the, the, uh, one of the things I love is that I buy hydrogen peroxide in a bottle you can pour or you can buy it in a in a spray and if you have seeds on paper towel you can already spray it. Um, it it's hydrogen peroxide as a soak is good um, I tend to rinse it and wash it off. Um, you can give things a light spray if they're starting to get a bit moldy and it'll just dampen it, but you don't necessarily have to um, you don't necessarily have to soak it and if things are already in um, say a stratified media you can still do the same thing. I would lay it out a bit more, spritz it, remix it, and a little bit of peroxide in there is not going to hurt it once you get it out. If you're close to being ready to sew and, you know, you put hydrogen peroxide on it for a day or two, it's it, it's not going to hurt it. Um, even when seeds are already germinating, peroxide doesn't tend to do, you know, anybody that reads anything about peroxide, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a beneficial um, treatment in lots of different ways. And there's very, there's very little you can do there's only a few species that are so sensitive to it that you know you'd have to be careful about rinsing it. But I think it's just it's super safe to try, especially if it, it's it's the safest mold anti mold agent that I have in my arsenal. So, 
Um, Ready for the next one? Sure. <laughs> Keep them what, coming. This is fun. <laughs> they're flying in. Um, what would you say are the most successful methods or species for direct seeding on a large scale, 0.5 to 3 acres? Basically asking how one farmer with more space than time can be impactful. Excellent. Um, okay, well, I will say that if you are converting farm fields, um, you are at advantage of having prepared ground that seeds love. Um, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of good agencies in Canada that um, can help you with if you, you know, if you're interested in prairie establishment, um, you know, tall grass, uh, tall grass Ontario was a, a really uh, good organization, I think that's still operating. Um, and there's a lot more folks, especially down in southwestern Ontario, they're working now with Alice, um, where you can get actually, I think you can get paid to install some some um, grasslands. And I think Forest Ontario also has a grasslands program going right now. Um, so those, you know, those kinds of size of projects, they take a few years to get going and they take a lot more math. But again, people will check for, you know, the plant, the, the plants that work best, um, you know, you'll probably get a maintenance plan in terms of mowing and possibly prescribed burning. And that's another professional thing that's, you know, I wouldn't recommend any homeowners try to prescribe burning by themselves, um, maybe other than burning your, your invasive species. But um, if you're, and you know, and, and I know that there's a big, there's a big push and obviously uh, we're involved with the 2 billion tree program right now to, uh, you know, people wanna, if it's appropriate and you wanna put trees back on the ground, you know, that's where machine planting, you know, most of the things that, that work on a large scale for farming have been adapted to replant, um, you know, some type of ecosystem. And it doesn't have to be all be hand planting, but um, some some things are really well done with direct seeding and and, and uh, drilling machines and, and, and hard like planting type machines. And then other things, there'll be certain species that maybe you want a little bit of that you hand plant and add in afterwards. So um, yeah, and if you want inspiration, I mean, look at, look, go to, go look at Germany or Europe where they're putting in all these uh, sort of wild, wild verges and, and on farm fields and they're, you know, they've got to, they've got to, Germany has a really amazing uh, native plant program with really good eco-regional seeds and a lot of suppliers and they've really boosted the the awareness of, of people putting in native seeds wherever and as much as they can so you know hopefully someday we'll get there. <laughs> Should I sh I'm gonna show my face I don't need my slides anymore. <laughs> What do you think of native plants that you can buy at stores or through catalogs? I think that must mean native plant seeds. What do I think of them? <laughs> so uh, again, um, I think that I am hugely in favor of obviously the native plant sector having as much support as you can, as much as I want people to DIY and try things and learn from the responses you guys gave in your polls. You know, I think it's really important that 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 people you know spend some time really getting to know their local growers and i don't just mean read what's on their website i mean go talk to them um it's amazing like growers are growers are the busiest but also the most uh you know approachable people i know because at their heart even if they are competitors um you know in the professional sense like they love these plants too they want to see these things do well um, I know that there's a lot of nurseries <clears throat> that get a bit of flack for still growing things that are getting banned elsewhere, but, you know, I, I've really seen that, that turn the tide. And I think that the more people that, again, talk to the growers and understand why they, why they do certain things or why they are sometimes out of economy forced to do certain things, um, you know, it really becomes, it really becomes clear, you know, who's, who's really interested in it, in it for, 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 for all the right reasons you might be. And, you know, maybe there's other places you can go or you hear about. So I, I also just, you know, again, I'm so enthused by, by how much native plant sales have taken off and, and how much, like, you can pretty much find anything you want any season. <laughs> I know it's hard sometimes when people have like that one plant that they can't get, but, you know, I think for the most part, you can find something. And, and online, those, those Facebook hive groups, they're furious. If you want to have an answer quickly or have some, you know, opinion poll about about who's who's the best people to buy from in your area, do that. Okay. 
Okay, next question. Can you please Ooh. explain again why it takes two years for some seeds to germinate and how could you speed up germination? Oh, this is where I'm like, okay, everyone's got a Zen, like everyone's got a Zen and, and let the plants do what they need to do. Um, so the biggest answer was back to that, that big book that I showed the Baskin and Baskin book is that, you know, the species that are the most complicated and most complex and usually the ones that are least available um, commercially are ones where the embryo is underdeveloped and they take multiple cycles of warm, cold, warm, cold. There's almost nothing that you can do as a grower other than excising those embryos and doing some crazy tissue culture or really expensive process to propagate them that's gonna make them go that much faster. Like I said, the best I could do with Trillium was five years from seed to flower. And that was with me, you know, being as diligent as I was on fertilizing and watering and keeping the weeds of them and transplanting them at the right time and, you know, trying to do everything right. Um, some plants just take a long time and they are notorious and they will always be notorious. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a few shortcuts with certain things like grafting that people can do with woody species to get them faster. Um, but then you, the trade-off is that you lose the genetic diversity part. So I think, um, you know, doing your research on, on, if you're interested in growing those things, look at all of the factors that you're wanting. If you just want a specimen plant, you know, again, a special grower with, with, with grafting experience or, you know, a, an ability to root something that's really difficult to get from seed might be the answer. If you're doing a big restoration project and you need, you know, genetic diversity or need to, you know, move some things from a plant rescue situation, then, then that might be the answer. And I mean, my Trillium seedbed, um, some of my rescues came from somebody that just clear cut a really beautiful um, property. And I rescued all those things off the front lawn because they were going to suddenly be in full sun. So, you know, I, I got all sorts of woodland plants from this property and it was really sad, but I was glad that I stopped and knocked on the door and said, you know, I, you know, these plants can't grow here after you, after you got rid of all your trees. So, um, oh yeah, there's so many questions. You guys are great. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. I wish this was a real audience because it's so much more fun to hang around and, and, uh, chat about these things for hours and I will stay on as long as people want me to. How about that? I'm energized. <laughs> okay, we've got one here uh, looking for recommendations for the easiest native food crops to germinate and grow in containers. Ooh, like to keep them in containers? That's what it seems to be saying. Um, I don't okay. know if you asked the question wants to clarify in the chat. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll say this from what, again, my experience in making native plants happy is real soil um, with with fruit with with things that are going to live a long time. I mean, you can get away, and I know you know. I know there's a number of people probably that have balcony gardens that are listening in on this. I mean, it's difficult to keep some of the native species happy in pots for a long time, especially woody plants. Um, fruit bearing stuff. I mean, some of the native raspberries and the sort of shorter lived, early successional type species. Um, you know, I, I know you can grow blueberries in a pot and you can grow raspberries in a pot and wild strawberries will probably do fine in most environments. Um, when it comes to, you know, bigger species, I just, I do think still that there's going to be challenges. It's, it, you know, most of our, most of our native edible species in larger, in larger taxa, um, you know, they're not as adaptable as say citrus is, uh, you know, everyone, everyone, my, my parents have, we have citrus trees and stuff at home and, you know, they can tolerate being in a pot for a long time. Um, but a lot of our temperate species just, they do better, they do better in, in, in wild soil. And, and a lot of them, you know, there's a good amount of species too. I mean, I started growing hazelnuts, I've been growing pawpaws, you know, so a lot of our, a lot of our Carolinian species, especially for those of you in Southern Ontario, I mean, they, they've grown up and around, you know, even if they're patchworks or, um sort of field areas there still tend to be things that can take a bit of part shade they're not they're not they're not mediterranean species that have been become adapted to sort of full sun hot baking hot baking areas and the other thing i'll say about pots is that you wind up with a situation and i've, I've done this with pawpaws i tried so hard to get pawpaws to grow forever 
And uh, the only time I've actually succeeded is when they weren't in pots because um, the, the root zone kill temperature by keeping them in pots, even in a, sh in a, in a greenhouse over the winter is that like the temperature fluctuation in with the pots not being buried was enough to kill them every time I tried. So um, yeah, it's, I find pots hard to manage. Um, and, and I say that as a grower, because I also, you know, anyone who's sort of looked after more than more than a hundred pots of something, you realize how soon you want to get them into real dirt and stop, let the rain take care of them. So um, hopefully that's not discouraging. I don't want to discourage anyone, but I think, you know, the shorter the lifespan, the easier it is to keep, keep pots um, alive and fruitful for you. No pun intended. Yes, coal frames do work well. Hi, Steve. <laughs> if we're not sure of the source of the native, in quote, seed we got from a friend, would we, would we be at risk of doing more harm than good by planting them when they could be from the US? I'm assuming this is a local person. Oh, you guys ask hard questions too. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I, I will state, and this goes back to, I think the indigenous, um, you know, acknowledgements, we've been making a mess of things for a long time. Um, so I think it's in, in general, good interest to just do your homework. And, you know, if your interest is in doing better, try to make sure that you are using things that, you know, are traceable. I mean, and I will say this also, perhaps, double-sided that you know the first picture i showed was wood poppy wood poppy is a species at risk um i was fascinated by it um in the garden in niagara the seeds came from a garden in niagara um i grabbed a couple took them home tossed them somewhere not thinking that they would grow they've gone gangbusters they're like a beast um i tried to trace back and find out where they were originally from and i eventually lost the trail at you know the one nursery where i found it that they got from so you can trace things back most of the time and um are you you know you hopefully can trace things back but southern ontario southern bc um you know if you're in an area that is highly fragmented and highly disturbed you're already probably dealing with a, a giant assisted migration hodgepodge. <laughs> um, we've been migrating things around Canada for 200 years. And, you know, Indigenous people move things around too. But I would say that the more the more wild spaces you are connected to, the more cognizant you need to be of seed sourcing. That's my final answer. <laughs> Following up on that, um, are there any Indigenous led native plant organizations you've worked with slash recommend? Oh, absolutely. Um, so that can plant map that I showed at the end, I mean, you can go in there and there is, you know, there's, there's a greenhouse operation in Sarnia, you've got Kayanase and Oshwekin, um, up toward, I, there's a bunch of, of uh, indigenous led or managed greenhouses um, in, you know, Northwest BC and, and or Northwest um, Alberta and Northeast BC, um, Twin Sisters. Uh, area up there and you know there's there's more and more of them coming along I know Rice Lake um, Alderville First Nation has a really wonderful just even educational garden and, and walkabout and you know there's there's I think it's challenging because I know that there's indigenous organizations that are trying to you know get involved in this and and it becomes something of an enterprise for them I also know that there's a lot of great indigenous groups doing really good conservation work that you know um, don't need our help because they do know or are, you know, re relearning their own traditions. And I think that that's, you know, equally encouraging. So, um, you know, again, I think in, in terms of, in terms of supporting indigenous led businesses, I think it's, it's, go, it's, it's a big mix across Canada and there's, there's, there's still a lot of sensitivity around harvesting rights. Um, so I think if you can find indigenous business and, 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 you know, again, talk to them and, and find out, I think there's, they're great businesses to support. And um, the more they get started, I think the better. Okay, we're getting awfully close to 8.30. I did just want to note that there have been a lot of questions about reference lists, um, books, uh, organizations, things like that. So I think if Melissa is willing, what we'll do with those is um, I will get her to send me that list and then we'll circulate it to everyone by email following um, the webinar. 
I will, I will give people the seed information database right now only because <clears throat> it's going to come down in a little bit. And I really do want people to go glean it while they can because I don't know where it's going to go. It, they, they have an issue with, um, I think, web accessibility standards in the UK or something that changed. Um, just give me one second. Yeah, I will, I will follow up um, with as many people as I can in terms of in terms of uh, providing some like bulk resources. And I mean, I didn't show the other things, but you know, the Gelito, so in terms of just germination research and dormancy research, you know, the Gelito has a really simple way of reclassifying Basque and they're just like, are they a fast germinator, a cold germinator, or are they a tricky germinator? And that's the three. And then there's, um, you know, Prairie Moon has, has a more complicated set of germination coding systems, but they generally follow the same non-dormant physiological dormancy their website's really good in terms of just, you know, if you're collecting yourself, but using theirs as a reference, at least it's Great Lakes specific for that region. Um, if you're out in Western Canada, there's a manual that's online on a reclamation um, site called the Osrin manual. It was oil sands reclamation something. I have to find it. I'll find the link. Um, that book is really fantastic for Western species. I mean, again, like because my work now spans Canada, when we got asked about Western species, we don't have that many samples of seed out there, but I'm always looking up sort of these local references. Um, BC's got a really great, BC has tons of great resources amongst a bunch of different folks as well. And in the States, in the States, you have the tribal nursery manual. Um, if you go into rngr.net, ringer.net, there's seed manuals at the wazoo there. I mean, my my buildup of knowledge has been on mostly free, you know, freely available PDFs and, and, you know, and, and literature that's available and a few books that I bought that are just sort of key stuff. Um, hold on. I'm going to grab SID. Here's the SID Q seed information database. Uh, uh, uh. So if you go here and you have to search these things by Latin names, so that's why I had to say Latin because that's it's a it's a database from Europe, um, but there are there's so much information in there. All right, I think we're getting told to shut down. <laughs> I have one more if you want one more, but I do want to wrap it up soon. Yes, Ali, sure. I think we should uh, close off because people are starting to say thank you and they're they're right. uh, leaving. Okay. Thank you, every thank you, everyone, for 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 listening. And I'll take one more question. Okay, I know there is a big resistance to using cultivars, and rightly so. But can you speak to any time you might recommend using a cultivar of a native species, i.e., like a more palatable, erroneous species, etc.? And are there specific examples of cultivars that you find worrisome? Ooh, double parted. Okay. Um, I will say that um, this is an objective based question. If you're asking about the cultivar for your own personal benefit, like cultivars of fruit and things that have been cultivated for us to eat are less, you know, more nutritious, less, less bitter. I mean, I think, I think when it comes to human edibility, um, cultivars are appropriate as long as they're kept in a garden. Um, if you're talking about ecological consequences, I know there are studies that compare and contrast, um, compare and contrast, and again, are they need to be based on real assessments. There are some cultivars that have shown to help, um, you know, that have increased pollination activity or benefit um, a certain type of insect in, in a bit more way than a generalist species. Um, I can't think of any particular off the top of my head. I know that I have a kind of personal hate on for how many echinacea species are published in uh, some of these catalogs that are they're they're just aesthetically pleasing but i don't think that they have an ecological you know benefit um for the some of the breeding effort that gets put into them and and i think they're just there's there's some really good programs i know doug talmy has been really involved in this stuff and i would just encourage people if you're doing ecological gardening to look up the studies that have um, sort of vetted these things, but the, I think the most insidious cultivars are the ones that are completely um, pollenless or have no nectar whatsoever. If they've been bred to be so many petals that they look like a pom pom, those are the ones I stay away from. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, we have so to. We'll, we'll end it on the pom pom note. <laughs> <laughs> 